Get in position, agents, and listen up. We have complete control of the cameras and the traps. But who operates that? They do. And who's that? I'm not exactly certain. Special operators from control. But we gotta work together on this one. Any questions? Let's rock and roll. Let's do it. Be careful out there, huh? And you. You keep your eyes open. We're all depending on you, especially Kelly. She should be there now. I'll switch you over. And good luck. Hello, greater YouTube area and the surrounding internet regions. This is Killer Cardinal DA7. Early last month, a story came out about Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. New members in the National Zeta Beta Tau fraternity held a contest referred to as a quote, pig roast, where participants earned points by sleeping with women. As the link to CNN I put in the description says, quote, in the event of a tie, additional points were awarded to the new member who had sex with a woman who weighed the most, unquote. Apparently, the higher ups in the fraternity didn't sanction it, so luckily it was somewhat isolated. But saying this type of thing is an isolated event leads us to believe that it doesn't happen outside of just this one time, when things like this have been happening for years. One of the parts I found particularly interesting about this story is that the women involved didn't know this contest was taking place, thus opening the door even farther whether some men want that door to swing farther open or not, for the larger discussion about coercion and consent. One side of the argument saying that by going through with it, the women basically consented, while many others see young females coerced into having sex when they didn't want to. And I'm sure in some of those individual instances of sex this story deals with, that's the truth. Some of them likely didn't want to, or at least didn't want to as much as they should have wanted in order to go through with it, but I find that aspect interesting because it raises even more interesting questions. For instance, I discussed words last time, and even though this video is more about physical behavior and action, coercion is both a word we need to define better and a behavior that we need to see change. I'm sure some men look at this story and brush it off as just guys being guys. Men have been talking women into sex for centuries, and sweet talking someone of legal age into saying yes isn't always evil or malicious. You can talk to someone, and they can legitimately change their own mind and agree to something you want. There's nothing innately wrong with being trusting or open-minded once in a while under the right circumstances. Not every instance of intercourse in history needs to be psychologically traced back to where morality was either born or killed in a person. Coercion, however, is defined by Google as, quote, persuading an unwilling person to do something by using force or threats, unquote. I know some people see the phrase coercion is not consent as an unreasonable statement, but there's a big difference between reassuring someone you're a safe, honest, upfront person who just wants to have some mutual fun with no strings then living up to that when they happen to say yes, and being forceful, threatening, pushy, deceptive, violent, or angry when seeing any negativity or pushback. That all being said, if all those frat guys at Cornell wanted to do is have lots of sex with a bunch of women and make it some kind of game, why didn't they just put out a subtle invitation to women around the campus? They could have set up a private web page or Twitter front to provide information and profiles of people involved, so any women who came to such an event or party would have been there of their own accord. They would have known exactly who would be present at any get-togethers or meetings, any women walking in the door would know 100% what would be involved, everyone, male and female, would get exactly what they wanted, and there wouldn't be any need for a discussion about coercion or consent when talking about this particular story. But those guys didn't do that. The entire crux of the contest was that the women involved didn't know what was going on. Those women were targets. They were very literal prey hunted by predators. And this happened in 2017. It's now 2018. There are unquestionably plenty of young women in college who want to have sex in large, unending quantities. I could be wrong about women. My experience with them is admitted not extensive, but I imagine when it comes to sex, most women just don't want to be lied to about it, or I don't know, maybe just prefer not being railroaded when they have hesitations. You'd think if a bunch of college guys wanted to hold a sex party of some kind, they'd be able to find plenty of women who are completely willing and eager to jump in with both feet, but no. Those guys willfully said, fuck that, we want women who don't know what they're doing. You'd think if men had a choice between A, fucking women who don't know their targets in a contest, women who, once they find out the truth, may be pissed off enough to bring some degree of vengeance down on the people behind said contest, or B, fucking women who not only know what they're getting into, but are just as horny as the men involved, who want to fuck those guys under the table, if I can use a drinking phrase here to imply more than, as opposed to a physical location, unless physical location on a counter or under a table holds some difference in bonus point values or scoring. I'm getting distracted. Anyway, I'd like to think horny men would choose for this particular purpose. B, the women who also want to fuck all night and sleep all day, the women who are eager to dive in the deep end, the women who arrive with bells on, and not the women they need to lie to 
or manipulate just to get them to comply at all. You understand what I'm saying here? Men are horny bastards and that in and of itself is entirely okay. If those frat brothers wanted to hold a contest involving a literal ton of sex as in a physical ton of bodies in one building eager to fuck each other, that's also 100% okay. I think we can all agree that saying the word college tends to invoke an image of young people eager to go crazy on their own away from the prying eyes of parents, correct? Okay, well, what a lot of people have a problem with is how orchestrated it was to ensure the women involved didn't know this was taking place. The fact that these women were targets, the fact that many of them were likely told lie after lie after lie to get them to consent just to win a competition, the fact that the women weren't respected enough to be given a choice and instead were manipulated and used, the fact that the largest one awarded extra points in the event of a tie. I mean, look, personally, I love women who are bigger and rounder. I happen to like that type of body shape more than women who are bony and skinny. That's not a judgment either. It's just a personal preference. There are plenty of skinnier women out there who I also find gorgeous. In a college pig roast contest, though, the largest women didn't grant more points because they were more desirable to those guys. Oh, dude, you got Susie? She weighs like 275. You lucky fuck. No, that didn't happen. Susie granted more points because whoever fucked her was taking a bullet because who would want to fuck that fat pig? When these guys could have easily spent a little more time, found women on campus who were actually genuinely interested in participating in an event full of mutually respectful sex where everyone gets points and everyone fucks each other in spirited, friendly competition where everyone gets naked with everyone else. Also, chips and dip and soda are complimentary. When that could have been the marvelous option to go with, I really can't help wanting to figure out the type of mindset you need to be in to think what happened in the actual story was the smart way to go. I mentioned last time that men want the perception of them being abusive rapists and waiting to change, yet many don't want to give an inch when it comes to how they behave. I may not agree 100% with what the term toxic masculinity encapsulates, but to imply some behavior that occurs in that definition isn't a little bit diseased. In other words, one man acts a certain way and when they see other men not acting that way, they call them out or threaten them until it spreads, is definitely missing something. Many of those men don't want women to assume they're sexist misogynists, yet they also don't want to examine their own behavior to determine where they can take any responsibility in how society treats women. The battle then becomes simply escaping a label or redefining it, then actually changing behaviors and fixing problems. If men want to see some of those perceptions and assumptions change, they might have to change course a bit themselves. In the same way though, women are growing more empowered and loud about how they feel, and that's a good thing to put relations and communication on more even footing. But while men have deserved to be questioned about behavior like the pig roast at Cornell for decades, women deserve to be questioned as well. It all needs to be done in the right way, with nuance and care and respect for each other's viewpoints. For example, men are being expected to stand up for women who aren't present, when women aren't in the room, when women aren't there to hear rude comments, when women aren't around to take offense. And yes, when it comes to talking about women in specifically extreme ways, men should defend women. Men are called out for behaviors associated with toxic masculinity. And I do agree that some of those behaviors can be destructive and harmful, but men are then expected to argue, corner, fight with, and dominate other men, potentially damaging or abandoning friendships, professional, or even business relationships in the name of women. So toxic masculinity is a bad thing, but it's better when it's aimed in the right direction. I'll admit, if a group of guys are hanging out, no girls allowed, and one of them shuts the whole room up by saying, I have got to rape a bitch tonight. One of those guys in the room may want to question what the first guy meant. It doesn't have to turn into a lecture about political correctness or how X percent of women experience sexual assault in their lives. Just gauge how serious that guy was. But that's also a really direct case. I don't know how often conversations happen that way. I doubt very often. I guarantee though, there are times when a bunch of guys are sitting around with no women in the room, maybe rating how hot various female celebrities are or talking about their favorite coworkers' bodies, which I think they should be allowed to do in the privacy of a small enough group. And I guarantee there are women who believe there should be at least one guy in that room who shuts that conversation down because it's offensive and objectifying and encourages quote rape culture, which I'll discuss later on. Like I said in the last video, I completely agree with the idea of degrees. If you think men should be discouraged other men from using phrases like rape a bitch when they really mean simply have sex with, I'm with you. That's a good idea. Should men be allowed to discuss how they feel about women's bodies or simply what they like most about women in a small enough group as tastefully as possible? Yes, they should be allowed to do that just as women are allowed to do it about men. One of those things is stopping dangerous behavior. The other is discussing preference and types. The latter is easily more harmless than the former. Now, I'm sure you recall the recorded discussion Billy Bush from Access Hollywood had with Donald Trump where Trump made the infamous grab them by the pussy remark. I linked a version of that in the description. Granted, this video being more an analysis about action, I wanted to discuss this story because it involved Trump and other men talking about physical action and behavior. That interview has been cited by thousands of people as also encouraging rape culture. But the thing is, Trump didn't just say grab them by the pussy. 
Along with those five words, he said this, when you're a star, they let you, which in my opinion opens up the conversation to consent and responsibility, as that remark implies that at least some women along Trump's way threw themselves at him and consented. But before we go any further, let me pull this back a bit to be clear about how much or how little I actually support those comments. The majority of the time, grab them by the pussy is a bad thing to say, especially in the context of random women who, like the women in the Cornell pig roast, don't know what's going on or haven't agreed to anything. There are very few circumstances when saying that is appropriate, and there needs to be an unbelievable amount of understanding, rapport, and trust to be on a level where it's okay to do without asking first. Spouses are the most likely, some adult entertainers who are accustomed to working together on a regular basis who are also close friends offset, some friends with benefits who fool around often enough to give each other a clear, open invite to grab each other, but the other 99.9% .9 of our existences, it's inappropriate without that level of context and should be called out as such, like the way Trump said it. What unfortunately messes things up a bit is that the things he said in that conversation weren't 100% untrue, as like I said, there are some women who have legitimately thrown themselves at Trump because they wanted attention or free gifts or trips or whatever else. He doesn't have to be a hot model for one or more women to want to do that. However, not being 100% untrue doesn't remove any of the unsettling nature from the remark. Many people saw that comment as a distinct and blatant throwing away of any real respect and decorum, and I think that's where the larger systemic aspects creep in. Most of Trump supporters would agree the guy is brash and over overly prideful, sometimes where it isn't earned. I get that some people see those things as selling points, but it's not so far a jump to assume much of that bravado pushes him to think he can treat women however he wants, especially ones that don't want to be treated certain ways. Trump may not have planned on running for president, and now that he's been elected, he's basically just riding the wave because fuck it, even if his approval ratings tank and he gets impeached, he can just go home to his palatial golden tower and retire in peace, a former president. But exactly how much recklessness, arrogance, and privilege does it take to not only make that comment, but either not be afraid the backlash or think there wouldn't be any worth addressing. Even without any real community or regular viewership behind me at the moment, I know that speaking to the public comes with consequence, to the point where I try to write these scripts as if I were speaking to millions of people, mentally preparing myself for the consequences that may come with such exposure. But you see, I'm humble enough to accept my place. Trump said those things as if nothing bad could possibly happen to him. When you're a star, they let you may open the conversation to talk about when a woman does consent to such treatment. I'll talk about consent in a bit as well. That's still not a mantra you can apply to literally every groupie, fan, or hanger-on that meanders across your path when you're a well-known enough public figure. There are bound to be some that choose to give you that pass when you're a star, sure, but you can't assume that it's okay to treat everyone that way simply because others throw that pass out there. You can't assume all fans or groupies want to be touched that way. Some women don't want it, and they deserve to be taken seriously when they either say no or report to others that they were treated that way. Now, you may also recall, Trump tried to defend those comments by saying, that's how men talk in a locker room. He used that defense once, then in one of the presidential debates, Andrew Anderson Cooper from CNN asked him about it, and he responded by talking about ISIS for two minutes, likely one of the most blatant red herrings in the history of human conversation. But the locker room defense is widely seen as flimsy because, quote, men shouldn't be talking that way, or that, quote, men don't actually talk this way. Lots of athletes like LeBron James came out and said, men don't talk like that in locker rooms. And even if that's true for some people, I think two key problems exist with thinking the locker room defense is flimsy. For one thing, even if everyone in the country agrees that men can no longer speak ill of women behind their back, there's no reasonable way to regulate small groups of two or more people speaking privately in every single case, even with good guys embedded to keep discussions secure. As scared as I am thinking about small groups of two or more women getting together and badmouthing me behind my back, I lose no sleep over the fact that I can't and shouldn't do a single thing to regulate or stop that. Those women are getting together in private, away from me, and they should be allowed to say anything about me that they please. And I say that especially as an aspiring YouTube creator. I pretty much have to accept that people of all genders will be talking about me without me being present. For someone who was bullied a lot when he was young, that shit is terrifying, but I have to accept it. Some of you may have watched, or at least heard of, the HBO program Sex in the City. One of the major themes was that Carrie, Samantha, Miranda, and Charlotte would get together and compare notes about their crazy experiences with men in their usual cafe or restaurant hangout spot, and sometimes they talked down about men, and sometimes they talked about men in diminishing, condescending ways, and sometimes they talked about men like they're pieces of meat, and the idea was that they were doing a great thing being so bold to speak that way behind men's backs. I want to take offense and be pissed because how dare women get together and act like I'm not worth anything but dick or think I'm stupid. But women have every right to get together and talk about men that way if they want and it's silly for me to be upset about it. That's the whole idea of privacy. You can speak to one or more people away from others without consequence, or at least far less consequence than speaking to large groups of people. If a guy gets together with other men and says things in private about women, that same aspect should apply. People need ways of expressing certain feelings, bouncing things off of others. And as I said, there are things that are said in small private groups that deserve questioning or acting 
acting on. Most comments outside of endorsing plans for actual physical attacks or abuse should probably be okay to say in private. Trump's problem though is that he said those things in an interview on TV. Even if you make the argument, well, that part of the interview was technically an outtake. He didn't realize he was being recorded. I mean, even if Billy Bush wasn't technically a quote journalist, he was still a TV personality in a position of wanting juicy stories to share for ratings. He could still have had his mic or camera on to leak something. And what do you know? Years later, it came up. What a surprise. Had only two people heard that tops and had he not been a household name, there would have been zero consequence, zero blowback. It would have gone nowhere. And do you know why? Because no one would have even known it had happened. The comments in the interview weren't dumb to make because they're exposing the dark underbelly of private male conversations happening all around us. Obviously, not every guy speaks that way about women or tells other guys to grab women in inappropriate ways. If that happens, people in those small groups can interject if they feel there's real danger. Trump's comments were dumb to make because while some people support it as just impulsive and off-the-cuff riffing, millions of people can now use that as inspiration to do it themselves and are doing it still. It may not have been a direct and premeditated verbal endorsement to assault women like some people think it is, but men can still view that as something to aspire to be. They can see his comments as valid because he's a celebrity and a household name. He must be doing something right. I may see the locker room defense as holding some amount of water, maybe a few drops, but the truth is when you're that well known, you follow different rules and have different standards to adhere to because more people are listening and watching and putting everything you say and do under a microscope. He has to try even harder to behave and adamantly chooses not to. He chooses to take no responsibility for what he's inspired. Here's the other problem with thinking the locker room defense is flimsy. Okay. The larger intention of some people in society is to shift behavior so that men in small groups of two or more speaking privately either aren't making comments deemed offensive or other men defend women when those comments come up. On paper, that seems fine. Like I said, some moments are bound to come up where men should at least question each other. I fully agree with that. But let's play devil's advocate. Let's say that intention comes to fruition. Let's say every man on the planet falls in line with this idea and not a single man makes an off-color comment about a woman even when women aren't around. If that successfully takes hold and happens 100% of the time, are women going to instantly feel safe and secure knowing that men aren't saying anything inappropriate behind their backs? No. Is there a significant chance that women are still going to feel unsure, doubtful, insecure, and unsafe? Yeah. I agree that men should respect women more. I agree that men should shut down behavior that is clearly headed for violence, abuse, dominant, or unhealthy behavior, and or criminal harm. And I agree that some speech among men can and should be adjusted to be more sensitive to women's senses of security and more respectful to their boundaries and self-esteem. Those things are absolutely reasonable. There isn't a single explanation why we as men can't do better in that area. However, some of these changes won't heal the entire problem and in some way is missing the bulk of the real problem. Fear is being allowed to drive action and decision making here. Some of that fear is justified and is calling for reasonable change. That's fine. However, the farther out that fear goes, the more unreasonable the changes that fear seeks to bring about become. The amount of angry response from aggressive men out there isn't diffusing any of that fear either. It's only making it worse. It's not helping any balance get reached. It's only antagonizing more women to be either more afraid or more angry in return. Action and actual behavior, like men inspiring other men to lie to women and get them in bed or coerce them into sexual acts they aren't comfortable with, changing those things is something I can get behind. Let's all try to put a stop to those things. What I don't really get behind is smoking out male terror cells, having the nerve to debate whether Scarlett Johansson is hotter than Megan Fox while looking at the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition or watching porn. That shit is unquestionably harmless, but is also under scrutiny. We need to be able to differentiate and focus in on the real problems and not just looking at everything as equally hurtful. I mentioned a couple of videos ago, the allegations against Brock Turner. The story goes that he allegedly drugged his victim at a party and violated her when she was unconscious. Two boys who were present caught him, tackled him, and Brock was charged with rape, which could have brought on 14 years in prison. However, after examination, he was sentenced to six months, being released after only three. Following that story, a society-wide discussion about consent sparked up. And one of the major pieces of media spearheading this discussion was a YouTube video about, oddly enough, tea as in putting leaves in boiling water or the beverage, T-E-A-T. -E I linked the video in the description. It's only about three minutes. It attempts to make a compelling argument about sexual consent by equating sexual actions and behavior to that of offering someone a cup of tea. And for the most part, it's pretty clear and the metaphor is at least watertight. Basically, someone can accept an invitation to something, but they also have the right to turn it down and not have it forced on them. Pretty simple. They can say yes to something one day and then turn it down another day. Also simple. They can accept something one moment and then fall asleep or pass out and that acceptance doesn't persist just because they said yes before. They can't continue accepting since they're no longer awake. All of this makes perfect sense to me. Don't force anything on someone who says no. Take care of people who are unconscious. 
Don't assume just because they said yes while awake and lucid that they're okay with you doing things to them while passed out. We should all get behind these ideas. They're not crazy in any way, shape, or form, and implying they are crazy is a big part of the problem. A couple of things about this video I want to address though. First, while re-watching it has reminded me of just how much sense it actually makes, one thing it doesn't effectively do is convince males who have the most potential to rape a woman that they have that potential. It doesn't speak to them on their level. It doesn't ask questions about things they've done to tap into where they are mentally to see if a change can be made in their behavior. I watched it and got the idea just fine, but I do feel like it comes off a bit condescending, almost talking down to people it needs to reach most. We can look at it another way. Maybe the people who need it to reach them most see it as condescending and thus the intention is lost, or I don't know, maybe the intention was just to mock those people for shits and giggles instead of making a poignant point about consent. Hopefully that wasn't the intention. I get it. Sometimes people feel like mocking something they think is stupid or idiotic or blatantly obvious. A group of college kids chanting about non-consensual sex with underage girls, however, like what I linked in the description, probably don't think the TV video is making an obvious point. The other issue I noticed with the T video is that it didn't discuss something that's been gaining more steam with each passing day. The idea that a woman can quote, retroactively withdraw consent. In other words, she consented the entire time during a sexual encounter or had mild questions about going through with it, but even though she went through with it and everything seemed fine, she would be able to look back on that moment and say, huh, yeah, I really don't think I was all there. I guess I was raped. That to me is a serious problem. But while I know there's a lot of sensitive issues floating around in the air here, I want to explain every part I can and hope that I can call out what I think is necessary while still being appropriately sensitive. Right off the bat here, questioning retroactive consent withdrawal isn't under any circumstances trying to victim blame. Blaming victims in rape cases has horrifyingly risen in popularity in recent years, and while I do think half a moment can be spared on real cases of women lying about being raped, like Gemma Beale in the UK, link is in the description, there is more than enough solid ground to say that thousands of women are raped every year, and it's completely safe to assume the vast majority of those cases are instances where there is no question that she didn't deserve to be treated that way. Situ situations where there isn't a single bit that can be seen as quote her fault or she was asking for it or she brought it on herself. Shoving cleavage out there, wearing labia skirts, and talking dirty aren't forms of consent. Even if an onlooker can mildly infer from an outfit or a demeanor that a woman may be looking for certain types of attention, attention and physical abuse are obviously two separate things. There isn't any way to tell what exact treatment any one particular woman wants and it's always safer to assume you should be more reserved than aggressive. The majority of instances of women getting raped are instances where they didn't do anything at all to bring it on themselves. Even instances when a woman quote teased a man. Sorry guys, but if there's any assumption at all that we're the ones completely in control over our feelings and impulses, then quote not stopping is entirely on us. Either we're in control and it's our fault for losing our shit or we're not in control and we have to do more to keep a lid on it. I completely get what the tea video is saying. If you offer someone, for example, a cup of tea, they take a sip and turn the rest down because they don't like the flavor or it just isn't for them, they're completely allowed to not drink anymore. Same with sex. If you and another person start getting it on, and the person you're with has second thoughts, they say they aren't ready or they aren't into it anymore, they're allowed to say no and stop. Withdrawing consent in the moment is entirely okay. Granted, it might make a person a bit of a jerk to dump scalding hot tea into someone else's naked body to initially inform them of that no, but saying no and a person accepting that no is a completely reasonable expectation. It shouldn't come under fire or criticism. But if the word no isn't enough to get a man to stop, then the scalding hot tea hitting flesh may be necessary just to escape. But that's another key difference men need to take into consideration when thinking about about the dynamics of a hookup. Ask yourself this question. How many men say the word escape to themselves in a way that isn't related to them having beauty standards that are too high like, dude, this bitch is ugly as fuck. What was I thinking? I need to escape. And how many women are truly in enough of a secure and powerful frame of mind that physically dominating a guy to a point where what she does during an intimate encounter prevents him from escaping or could be considered rape in any way, shape, or form? I'll agree. If we're going to address the idea that, quote, coercion is not consent, then a married guy drowning his sorrow half in the bag who gets accosted by a woman in an aggressively seductive way into making an extremely bad decision for his entire life may not be getting raped or even forced or threatened, but he's definitely vulnerable. He's not in the clearest mindset. That woman would be taking advantage of that man, that's fair to say. However, I don't personally believe men are mindless sex machine cyborgs who can't shut their libido off. I'd wager that most men know that deep down, yet many choose to not shut it off or think it's crazy for them to have to shut it off. Additionally, many women who have been taken advantage of aren't under that impression that we can, and when they see the oceans of men online bitching at them when the topic of rape culture comes up in discussion, it only helps solidify that viewpoint. Rape culture per southernct.edu is, quote, an environment in which rape is prevalent and in which sexual violence is normalized and excused in the media and popular culture. The website also says, quote, rape culture is perpetuated through the use of misogynistic language, the objectification of women's bodies, and the glamorization of sexual violence, thereby creating a society that disregards women's rights and safety, unquote. I think some of the things in that second part have a little more wiggle room than the rest, but the first part is something society 
society does to a much more significant degree than most of us would like to admit. Society does have a tendency to place more responsibility on women when it comes to looking at how sexual encounters go and who ultimately takes the blame, leaving the men, usually the actual attackers, the physical perpetrators of the violence that occurs, either blameless or taking much less of the punishment. The woman usually looks like the whore who turned the man into a monster. She put things in front of him that made him uncontrollable. I hate to go back to the religion well, but I kind of have to, as this closely resembles the attitude religion sometimes has. A website called LetGodBeTrue.com attempts to make this case by explaining that women have power over men, citing Proverbs 7.21, quote, With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. It then goes on to elaborate on their own, quote, Flattery is excessive praise used to seduce someone against his will. It is presenting a matter very favorably in order to make it more pleasant and to beguile the listener. Men love the praise of a woman, for winning the adoration, favor, and devotion of a woman is an instinctive drive placed in their hearts and loins by God. Evil women manipulate this desire in men to prey on them in their various schemes of seduction for selfish purposes, unquote. So if I'm going to mention this, I should probably address my last video, which started with me saying, quote, I love women, and expressing how getting to interact with them does make me happy. Thing is, I have the self-control necessary to not attack every woman who happens to say words to me or smile in my direction or give me a compliment. I'm not turned into a monster with a sliver of flattery. I'm a mildly intelligent, civilized person, not a fucking animal. For all the time religious people spend acting like outcasts and victims of government restricting their rights, this is one aspect, especially an accepted Christian Bible scripture, that I feel gets severely overlooked in terms of how it's shaped our growth as a society. For religion to act like it's okay to imply that in modern society, when women get victimized by sexual violence, it's 100% their fault is entirely unacceptable. I'll acknowledge I haven't painted religion in a very good light since I started this channel, and I do want to reiterate that if you believe in one or more gods, I respect your right to do that and respect you as a person for having faith that I've clearly lost. However, religion and religious representatives need to address this aspect that is much more likely to encourage an entire culture of rape by excusing it and sweeping accusations under the rug than media. Do I think media such as movies and TV and video games encourage rape culture by quote, glamorizing images of sexual and non-sexual violence towards women? Not entirely, just like I don't think those things encourage every viewer or player to become bloodthirsty murderers when killings and death appear on screens, and killing men is far and away more normalized in those forms of media than in instances of sexual violence against women. Plus, media sometimes uses images attached to sexual violence to raise awareness and support for victims. Years ago, sexual violence might be considered glamorized, but these days, a man committing rape on screen is depicted more evil than heroic. Despite being accused of glorifying and exploiting the pain of others for money or profit, media is at least sometimes intended by its creators to help solve those problems and not exacerbate them. So no, I don't consider the whole of America to be one big rape culture in a diseased petri dish. However, if you spend enough time thinking every woman is a manipulative liar exaggerating every bit of unfair treatment she suffered, you might be part of the problem. I'll admit that personally, in most cases of abuse that come up in the news, I do want to know as many details as possible to determine where responsibility should be taken, but I do also acknowledge that the amount of women who have been sexually assaulted in their lives is unquestionably high, the amount of unreported rapes is high, and the amount of reported rapes that get thrown out as her fault is also way too high, and behavior needs to change as soon as possible to start the process of fixing this. When it comes to retroactively withdrawing consent, I think that needs a greater examination, as I think it has the potential to be taken too far too often. Rape cases do need to inflict harsher justice on the men involved and protect actual victims more. I completely agree with that. But rewriting what happened in a situation, especially if things do change and consent becomes much more obvious, is a bad precedent to set simultaneously with better behavior. Let me use the tea metaphor here with a nicer scenario to explain what I mean. Let's say I offer someone a cup of tea. They say, sure, I'd like a cup. They drink some. I ask them how they like it. They're not thrilled. I mean, it's tea. It's not exactly fruit juice or soda or good old H2O, but it's fine. I tell them they can pass on the rest if they don't like it. They say, no, that's no, fine. I'll keep it. I offer them some honey to put in it. They say, that sounds great. And they put it in their cup. They try it. They seem a little happier and they drink the rest down. I ask if the honey helped and they say, yeah, it did. I ask if they'd like any more and they say, no, thank you. I'm fine. So I put the rest in the fridge or whatever the hell else you're supposed to do with leftover tea. I've never made enough of it to need to store it. But anyways, a few months later, they knock on my door and they say they're mad at me. I ask why. And they say, because they never really wanted that cup of tea to begin with. I remind them. They said yes when I offered it. They drank the entire thing. They never once said they were having second thoughts about drinking the rest. I even checked in numerous times to ensure they were still enjoying the tea. And when I saw they weren't enjoying it as much as they could be, I offered something that they agreed helped them enjoy it more to the point of finishing it. If we're bringing the metaphor back to sexual encounters, this is likely how they should go, or at least how some people think they should go. Now, in case you didn't count, in my hypothetical, I asked three times if they were okay or happy with the tea. I asked if they wanted to back out of drinking the rest. They said no. And I offered something to make the experience better, which was accepted. To some men, this may seem like wild amounts of overkill to do something as simple or casual as being intimate. I put a link in the description to the love contract sketch from Chappelle's show. 
Granted, I find that sketch funny because it clearly goes too far, but that's likely what some guys foresee needing to do in order to not be slapped with the most extreme rape allegations. But that's another part of where those systemic aspects come into play. That conscious lack of awareness of the difference between a person looking to put a body part of theirs into another person, or if the recipient can even make a viable escape should no not be an acceptable answer. I know some men might be hearing this and they're thinking, shit, you mean I need to ask every second during a sexual encounter if a woman is still consenting? Talk about killing the mood. Ensuring a woman you're with sexually is pleased is probably something you should be doing anyway as a man. Plenty of women fake orgasms and play up being pleased when it's not true, and that's both a problem with women needing to adequately communicate honestly when a man they're with isn't pleasing them, as much as a problem with men who are unable to deal with being told that. Personally, I'd rather a woman be visibly and audibly displeased with me than fake it. At least I know the truth and can change what I'm doing. But some men don't handle being told they aren't good lovers all that well, to put it politely. And the unpredictability of that conversation sometimes bringing about anger or violence is part of what makes some women just fake it and let it go far too long. I'm not saying it's okay for women to lie. They should be honest. I'm saying men need to be more accepting of that truth to make women feel safer being honest with them. That all being said, for a man to ask questions to ensure a woman they're with is still mentally and ethically on board isn't too far a jump from checking in to see if she's honestly pleased or satisfied, something they can do to eliminate any need a woman could have to fake things anyway. Asking lots of questions may feel like it breaks the mood, but if you ask enough and a woman isn't feeling it, probably safer to pull back than push through because you're almost there. At least if you ask and she tells you to keep going in the moment and then tries to withdraw consent later, you can respond with, I asked her 10 friggin' times. She was practically annoyed how many times I asked. I completely advocate for men to ask women if they consent a ton of times during sexual encounters. But again, let's play devil's advocate. Let's say that happens and men everywhere ask women for consent tons of times during encounters. The question I feel would then be placed back on women's shoulders. Is retroactively withdrawing consent even viable in that scenario? Or will another avenue to punish men be preferred instead? Obviously, this isn't to imply asking for consent is something we shouldn't bother doing at all. I'm simply looking ahead to the next step. Is the idea to diminish men back? Or are we looking to fix behavior so that no punishment or backlash is needed because nothing is going wrong anymore? To be frank though, if men want to make more women feel comfortable enough to have more sexual encounters, the best thing we can do, men, is to help set a wider precedent of being safe, knowing when to shut off the passion and pull back, letting women know that if they have a change of heart, midway through some encounter and they want to stop and regroup and think it over, they can stop things at any time or turn things down altogether and go at a pace they're comfortable with. For a lot of women, safety is a huge part of what would make them say yes anyway. Granted, a guy they know conclusively won't take advantage of them or hurt them won't turn to a Casanova just because he's safe or nice. It just lets women know they have more control and choice in a situation. And I know some women may be hearing this and thinking I'm being a disgusting jerk telling men that not attacking you will make more of you want to have sex and that shouldn't be the incentive for better behavior. You're completely right about that. So let me explain further and adjust just a little bit. Check out the article by Olivia Fleming from Daily Mail I linked in the description. It's a fairly angry response to an article by Emily Yoff from Slate.com discussing the prevalence of sexual assault and how Ms. Yoff cited the distinct link between women not wanting to be attacked and women getting drunk. The Daily Mail article makes the case that women are being blamed for rape because they binge drink when more of the onus should be on men and how they behave around women and how many of them attack women. The larger sentiment is that when a woman gets sexually assaulted and a man calls her out for dressing like a slut, being too flirtatious, leading him on, she shouldn't have to adjust any of those behaviors. I'm inclined to agree. Women shouldn't be afraid of being attacked when drinking, but just because I've never feared getting raped in a social situation, one of the reasons I don't drink heavily and have never been drunk, period, is because I know full well that when people drink too much, something commonly happens. We all know what it is, say it with me, what gets lowered with too much alcohol? That's right, inhibitions. You know, inhibitions, those things that prevent all of us from doing things we either don't want to do or we really want to do but are consciously afraid of doing because we know they're dangerous or risky, saying things we don't mean to say or share, go places we don't mean to go. Drinking causes judgment judgment to get thrown way the fuck off. I agree with Olivia Fleming's main sentiment from the Daily Mail. Saying to women that they should stop drinking to avoid getting raped or abused isn't the answer. But while I would tell a woman who doesn't want to make herself vulnerable that drinking less might help make her less vulnerable, I would say the literal same thing to a ragingly horny college male that if he doesn't want to risk losing his shit and attacking someone, he should also consider drinking less. Trust me, I would love to advocate people getting shit-faced and inebriated at every party because it's 100% harmless and all it encourages is night's chocolate full of consensual sexual experimentation with absolutely no risk of STIs or pregnancy or alcohol poisoning or overdosing or attacks or misunderstandings or anything. But getting hammered doesn't just put you in a state of conscious yet heightened senses. Losing your inhibitions means you're more likely to turn into an unrestricted, unfiltered, unfettered, overall unpredictable crazy person prone to breaking the law and or making severely dangerous decisions. So yes, I'm saying women shouldn't be to blame when they get drunk and vulnerable. And I agree that getting drunk is not an excuse when 
guys commit rape while drunk. Sounds like a bit of a double standard, so let's do a little devil's advocate lightning round to see why this makes sense. Number one, let's say that no more women are raped anymore. It completely stops. Does that mean women getting falling down drunk aren't in any danger anymore? No, they can still hurt themselves, fall, drive, crash, fight, etc. Drunk women are still vulnerable and in some danger, even if rape is removed from the equation. If a woman gets drunk, climbs to the top of a house, falls and breaks her neck, are the people serving her drinks held responsible? No. If you do something while drunk and no one forced you to drink, then in some way you're responsible for what you do while intoxicated. However, and this is pretty important, the most a woman who drank on her own can be held responsible for if she gets attacked while drunk is making herself a little more vulnerable. She's not responsible for getting attacked, being vulnerable doesn't mean she brought it on herself. She's not asking for physical abuse because she's tipsy. And that's just in a situation where she chose to drink on her own. What about the instances when men harass women to drink more to make them more vulnerable? If rape didn't happen anymore, getting drunk would still present physical danger that can prove fatal. This is true. But plenty of men feed women alcohol to make them more compliant. So yes, as Emily Yoff's article implies, drinking less can help women be less vulnerable and more aware. Unquestionably true. However, as Olivia Fleming says, ultimately less drinking doesn't solve the problem of sexual assault and abuse. Number two, if I were to get blackout drunk with the wrong group of guys in a scenario where raping women doesn't happen, does that mean I'm suddenly going to be safe? No. Guys that have the potential to physically force themselves on a woman or physically take advantage of a woman when she's inebriated or unconscious are likely to move to other viable targets instead. And if that includes physically weaker men, that's where they'll go. I'm sorry if this seems like I'm making women's problems about me. My point is simply that the aggression of rape culture in this scenario isn't changing at all. It's just the target of it that would be changing. Obviously, not all men are power-hungry monstrous rapists, but men who have the most potential of that type of act likely get off on the power aspect of sex, not simply physical satisfaction or mutual pleasure. It's not morally wrong to be sexually aroused at having power over another person in a safe enough situation, but that fantasy needs to be channeled the right way and compartmentalized. Not every person wants to be overpowered or gets off on being submissive, just because some do. That desire, while innately harmless, needs to be dealt with under a microscope just as much to help all this get better. And then number three, let's loop this back around. Let's say society really does change on the whole. Men adjust their behavior and women literally change nothing about how they look, speak, act, etc. You're telling me more women won't end up feeling more sexually empowered knowing that they have vastly more control than they did before? That they can decide to proceed with every step of a sexual encounter? Isn't that part of the point of shifting how society works in this area? To make more women feel safer so they can enjoy life and make more pleasurable decisions if they choose instead of A, feeling obligated when they don't want to, B, feeling pressured or forced when they don't think a person is safe to be with, or C, being physically used even after saying no? If you ask feminists if the intention of ending rape culture is to have all heterosexual intercourse banned or to make all men subservient to women in every possible way, they likely tell you no to both of those things. Okay, cool. If the intention is simply for women to be safer, to have more control, to feel more empowered, I have no problem with most of that responsibility being on us men to meet that change. But with more safety and control, more women are likely to feel better about initiating, being bold, and taking the reins. Those are somewhat likely shifts, and all of that may come from men pulling back and creating safer experiences for women. Does that mean women can immediately go from 100% protecting themselves to 100% free and loose? Of course not. Until more men act safer and more reserved, women will likely have to continue protecting themselves as unacceptable as people like Anna Akana think protecting oneself is. I agree with her. Link is in the description to her position, but it's not an overnight change to say the least. I feel like being able to retroactively withdraw consent sometimes goes a little too far. It assumes that women never make bad decisions. A woman can let a man grab her, for example, being okay with it in the moment, then a year later say to herself, I really don't like him. I don't like that he did that to me. I guess I didn't want that after all. Or they can change perspective of past events and imply, well, I never said no and he didn't ask me. Therefore, that means I didn't want it after all. And that means by not asking me, he took advantage of me. And all possibly because he didn't read the required Miranda rights before proceeding. You have the right to say no. You have the right to decline consent. You have the right to turn me down and have me walk calmly out the door. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you by the court. With these rights in mind, are you still DTF? Like I said, I agree with men getting much harsher punishment for committing rape, but are men going to get jailed on technicalities? He only asked nine times instead of the required 10, so therefore he's headed to the pokey. I want to agree somewhat with retroactive consent withdrawal, but genuine question, where is the line drawn to say, okay, okay, retroactive withdrawal is one thing, but here is where it stops being valid. I don't think anyone who advocates for retroactive withdrawal has really nailed that down, which turns the concept into something of a threat. Not every woman consents to doing things with 
certain men. And if a woman didn't consent to certain things, she needs to be more open with those details, even just privately to authorities so action can be taken. But if a woman consents to an unwise or potentially unpleasant decision, it seems like those bad decisions can simply be rewritten. It happens in video games all the time. There are games with huge consequence, characters can be lost or changed permanently, opportunities for rewards can be lost, and players circumvent this consequence by quote, saves coming. In other words, saving a game right before a big event or battle or decision, and when that event or battle or decision goes badly, if it fails, or even just doesn't go optimally, all you have to do is reload your save file as many times as necessary until it goes exactly as perfect as you want it to go. Unfortunately, life isn't like that. You can't just reload a save file in life and redo things until they're perfect. You don't get do-overs when interacting with people. Things happen, and very often, you need to deal with consequences. Granted, rape isn't a consequence. Hopefully we can all work together to reduce that down to as close to never happening again as possible. But if it drops to never women, there are still going to be some of you who get into a situation with a guy that you agreed to doing things with the entire time. The guy even checks in and asks. And after all that, you may still end up regretting it a little. I don't want to see ordinary everyday regret turn into, I never wanted that. He took advantage of me. I'll definitely advocate for rapists to get harsher punishments and for men to teach themselves and young boys to act better around women. But I'd also advocate for women when getting into situations they know they consented to that weren't physically harmful and didn't involve any abuse or attack to be honest about that and deal with any little bit of regret that occurs like an adult. A man who drinks too much and is well aware that doing so may cause him to black out and have zero control over himself when he's drunk should not be able to hide behind intoxication to get out of taking responsibility for rape, not when so many men can become uncontrollable monsters while drunk. May not be every single one, doesn't have to be. Drinking lowers inhibitions. A man can want to fuck the shit out of every woman on the planet like Lil Wayne, and if he says that's sober and doesn't actually try, he's merely a loud mouth who should probably be nicer or more sensitive. But if he drinks too much, that want that he has control over 99% of the time is going to come forward and he may try to do it. And if he tries it with the wrong woman who doesn't want him, he's in trouble. In the same way, a woman who has conscious, sober, completely lucid sex with a man fully to one or more completions, a man who is under the impression that the woman he's with is consenting 100% of the time they're together, should not be able to say, even though you checked in with me numerous times, you're a rapist now. Most instances that would be considered full-on rape are likely open and shut cases. Not every case that pops up requires the freelance detectives in the collective internet universe to dig deep to get to the bottom of the deceptive, malicious, leftist front looking to undermine the innocent and pure men that would never even think of hurting a woman. Fuck that shit. Sometimes men abuse women. It really happens. And when it does, I know it has to be hard for a woman who's been raped to think clearly enough to immediately go to authorities or even just friends for help, especially with so much distrust out there. But any woman who suffers significant acts of violence, sexual or otherwise, should act as soon as they can to get any mistreatment that occurred recorded as soon as it happens. And ladies, if you are physically attacked, abused, battered, violently assaulted, etc., you go to the authorities immediately and they give you serious run around. They tell you to your face, well, basically, on what you're telling us and what we're seeing, we're not likely to get a conviction. Record a video on your phone and upload it to Facebook or Twitter. Hashtag Me Too may have been easy for some people to fight because it's just a hashtag, but if that didn't garner the attention this issue deserves and you still want a revolution, watch how quick Facebook removes or blocks a video from a woman who was raped literally minutes ago. Most of us, when we hear the word rape, are pretty clear on what it means. Even if that meaning expands to include things that aren't specifically or relegated to forced insertion of a penis into a big enough orifice like a vagina, it's still important implies things we can wrap our heads around, like 1. Some degree of physical force. 2. The victim being physically unable to defend themselves whether because they've been overpowered or drugged or can't escape a room or situation. 3. The victim having their body violated in various ways, typically sexual ones. All three, sometimes a combination of at least two of those three things. Brock Turner's accusations apparently involved him fingering his victim while she was unconscious. Even if that's true, does that make it much less sickening that he only fingered her and wasn't plunging his dick into her? Not really. She was still unconscious and he was still taking advantage of her when she wasn't able to consent or fight back or run away or anything at all to communicate or protect yourself. Men, I have your back in terms of fighting for what's fair for us, but let's be honest, are we really going to try and defend our supposed right to fuck women who are unconscious? We don't have that right. Can we at least agree bare minimum that fucking a woman who's unconscious is extremely creepy and should not be something we do? Can that at least be a no-brainer? No matter how much of a heavyweight in stand-up comedy history Bill Cosby was or how influential on entertainment media Harvey Weinstein was, both deserve judgment if they haven't taken it already. For my third and final video on this, at least for now, I'll dig into those two as well as other big names along with various reactions and resulting backlash next time. This is Killer Cardinal DA7 reminding you to use your head, be nice to each other, and take the time to think. Talk to you later. Hello. I hope you've been having fun. Now it's our turn. <laughs> Pity you won't be here for the rest of the show. 
Bye. <laughs>